fear in death. My power is continued. Born on September 6th of 1955, Sharon Lee Gallegos was raised in the small city of Almogordo, New Mexico, by a dedicated but struggling single mother named Guadalupe. The family lived in a small two-bedroom house, but shared the home with six of their extended relatives, meaning a total of 11 people, most of them children, were packed into a place designed for no more than four or five. Guadalupe was employed full-time as a housekeeper at a local motel and relied on her sister and cousin for child care while she worked long and grueling hours. Financially speaking, they were desperately poor, but in terms of happiness, they were rich beyond measure. By the time she was four, Sharon was described as feisty but a happy-go-lucky child. She adored her young siblings and cousins and didn't mind sharing toys, beds, or bathtubs. To her, it was like every night was a sleepover, a slumber party that never ended. She enjoyed helping her mother in the kitchen, insisted on accompanying her to the grocery store, and generally did everything she could to alleviate the strain of her mother's selfless hard work. Yet one day, Sharon's mother and aunt noticed a distinct change in her attitude and behaviors, and naturally, they were deeply troubled by it. One day, Sharon's mother asked her if she'd like to go to the grocery store. Usually, Sharon would leap at the chance, running to fetch her coat and shoes before meeting her mother at the family car. But on this occasion, Sharon seemed uncharacteristically dispassionate about the idea. Her mother attempted to talk her into it, but Sharon wouldn't budge. In fact, she told her mother that she didn't want to accompany her to the grocery store ever again. Guadalupe also observed that her daughter seemed more and more hesitant to play outside with her siblings and cousins. Whenever she did, she seemed visibly tense and only remained outdoors for a brief period before returning inside. Sharon's aunts and mother tried to talk to the girl regarding her newfound anxiety, but she would only give vague responses. Sharon claimed that there were people she didn't like, people who frightened her, and that she sometimes saw them during their trips to the grocery store. Her mother pressed her for more information, but the four-year-old girl was unable to properly articulate herself. A few weeks later, Sharon was sitting with her mother on the porch outside their home while her siblings and cousins played in the street outside. At one point, the girl's mother looked up to see a green sedan suddenly slow its pace as it passed their home. The vehicle continued down the street without stopping, yet Sharon became visibly alarmed by the incident, then ran upstairs to her bedroom and hid under the covers. Naturally, her mother was extremely alarmed at this behavior, so she gently but persistently questioned her daughter on why that green sedan seemed to frighten her so much. Once again, she proved incapable of properly articulating her fears, and despite insisting that she didn't like whoever drove that green sedan, she either couldn't or wouldn't identify them. While Guadalupe recognized the need to protect her daughter from dangers both without and within, it seems she completely misjudged her daughter's level of intelligence. Sharon wasn't going through some bizarre childhood phase of deciding she didn't like certain people. In fact, she had a very good reason to fear that green sedan. Every Sunday morning, Guadalupe would take Sharon and the other children to the local church service, and July 17th of 1960 was no exception. Sharon was a very religious woman and believed that faith would serve her children well, but since she was perennially occupied with work, chores, or corralling children, she was always one of the last to arrive at Sunday service and always one of the first to leave. Again, this was no exception on the morning of July 17th, yet Guadalupe was so occupied in making sure all seven children were accounted for that she failed to notice that the driver of a green sedan appeared to be watching them from across the parking lot. Apparently, little Sharon didn't notice either because there's no mention of her becoming anxious or scared while on the way back from church. Yet just minutes after they departed, as the congregation chatted and exchanged well wishes on the lawn outside the chapel, a woman climbed out of the sedan's driver's seat and approached the gathered crowd. Churchgoers would later say that the woman seemed very interested in Guadalupe and her children, but since her curiosity seemed anything outside of benevolent, 
The congregation thought nothing of it, and there was no mention of it to Guadalupe. Two days later, a woman walked up the driveway of one of Guadalupe's neighbors. After the homeowner answered the door, the woman told them that she was looking for a woman named Guadalupe and believed that she had been given the wrong address by a colleague. When the neighbor asked why the mysterious woman was looking for Guadalupe, she replied that she wanted to offer her a well-paying job. Wanting nothing more than to be helpful, the neighbor not only told the woman the address of their family home, but also detailed information on their living arrangements. The mysterious woman thanked the neighbor for their time and patience and then walked back around the block to where a green sedan was waiting for her. It makes for a sickening irony that Guadalupe's neighbor must have believed she'd done a favor when in reality she'd secured her daughter's doom. At around 3 p.m. on July 21st of 1960, Sharon was playing with her cousins in the alleyway behind her home. She appeared to feel safer in a closed space compared to an open one, and her mother believed that she was getting over her period of fearful paranoia. In actual fact, Sharon had simply trapped herself in, so that when the big green sedan rolled up to one end of the alleyway and the mysterious woman blocked off the other, she had nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. At first, the mysterious woman offered Sharon candy as she approached, then when the little girl refused, she offered her new clothes. These tactics might have worked on other young children, but not Sharon, who ran screaming towards the back gate of her home. But the girl was too slow and her abductors too fast, and before she could make it to safety, Sharon was snatched up, bundled into the green sedan, then driven away. Sharon's siblings and cousins, some of whom had also run from the mysterious abductors, immediately notified their parents of her fate. The police were summoned, and within just a few hours, roadblocks had been set up along hundreds of miles of New Mexico Highway. It's believed that hundreds of vehicles were stopped and searched over the days that followed, but frustratingly, not one was found to contain the missing Sharon. Based on the children's description of her, the mysterious woman was said to be an overweight blonde woman in her 30s or 40s, while her male accomplice was tall, wiry, with a flop of sandy brown hair. Both descriptions were released to the public along with details of the sinister green sedan the couple had been driving, but eerily, they seemed to have escaped the area while remaining completely undetected. When it came to establishing a motive in the immediate aftermath of the abduction, police were quickly able to rule out ransom given the lack of note or list of demands. They were also able to rule out the possibility of the abduction being a crime of opportunity, as Guadalupe mentioned that the sight of a green sedan had caused her daughter great anguish in the recent past. It was quite clear that Sharon's abductors had been stalking her, and had been doing so for quite some time, but what makes this instance so much more chilling is that Sharon had noticed, while her mother had not. The timing of the kidnap suggested the girl's abductors were not spur-of-the-moment amateurs, but rather cold-blooded professionals. They could have snatched Sharon at almost any point over the previous few months, but instead they watched and waited until the moment was just right. There's also a good chance that a great deal of the couple's preparation involved the process of properly exfiltrating Sharon from her surroundings. Taking her would be easy, but concealing both their prize and themselves would prove a challenge to any kidnapper. Yet the couple extricated themselves from the locale so proficiently that it borders on the preternatural. Police were so baffled by the case before them that they began to suspect internal involvement. To them, only a friend, relative, or acquaintance had the knowledge and know-how to so completely disappear little Sharon without any public sightings whatsoever. Yet this completely contradicted the bulk of eyewitnesses' reports they collected, many of which mentioned how the green sedan had seemed to patrol the neighborhood in the days prior to Sharon's abduction. Just over a week after Sharon first went missing, a Las Vegas school teacher named Russell Allen was hiking through the Arizona deserts when he happened across something horrifying. Sticking out of the sand were what appeared to be the partially decomposed remains of a child. When forensic examiners arrived to examine the shallow grave, 
They discovered tire tracks leading to and from the nearby highway, along with two sets of footprints, one belonging to an adult male and the other set belonging to a child. At the time of her death, the child had been dressed in red shorts, a button-up blue blouse, and a pair of adult-sized flip-flops that had been cut to fit the feet of the child, with leather straps to secure them. The child's fingernails and toenails had also been painted a bright red color. Law enforcement also recovered a number of suspicious items from a site not far from the child's grave. Some of the items included a knife, clothing, and footprint impressions, all of which were sent to the FBI for further testing. An autopsy confirmed that the body did indeed belong to a young girl, who was between 5 and 7 years old when she died. She weighed between 50 and 60 pounds and also been dead for at least a week or two when her body was finally discovered. Examiners also observed that the girl's hair appeared to have been dyed, possibly by her captor as a way of obscuring her identity. Yet strangely, there were no obvious causes of death. There were no puncture wounds, no broken or fractured bones, nor were there any serious ligature marks or signs of internal bleeding. There were horrific burns from where someone had tried to dispose of the little girl's body by setting it ablaze, but the coroner was also able to determine that the immolation had occurred post-mortem and not while the girl was still alive. Despite the ambiguity regarding the girl's cause of death, the county coroner ruled her death a homicide, and instead of Jane Doe, she was nicknamed Little Miss Nobody. When the FBI caught wind of the body's discovery, federal agents were sent over to the Arizona wilderness in which it was found. They got to work piecing together the details of the little girl's murder, and for a while, it seemed like the charred remains did indeed belong to Sharon. But once it was confirmed that the corpse was that of a seven-year-old girl and not of a four- to five-year-old, the agents were forced to drive back to New Mexico empty-handed. For a long time, Guadalupe Gallegos kept a tight hold on her ever-dwindling hope that one day she and her daughter would be reunited. But finally, she accepted that little Sharon was most likely deceased. Following an official court ruling of dead in absentia, a small memorial service was held to finally mark her passing. It was a painful affair, not just because a young girl's life had been snatched away from her long before her time, but because there were still unanswered questions regarding her untimely passing. Guadalupe had no idea who'd taken her little girl, nor could she comprehend why, out of all the little boys and girls in Alamogordo, Sharon had ended up the sole target of their predations. Over the next 58 years, the painful memories of Sharon's abduction began to fade, but they were never forgotten. Naturally, Guadalupe Gallegos prayed daily for the soul of her departed daughter, right up until 2011, when she passed away at the ripe old age of 87. She'd always prayed that, no matter how dark or disturbing, the truth of her daughter's disappearance would one day be brought to light. And in 2018, forces were set into motion to answer those very prayers. In 2018, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children made the decision to revisit the case of Little Miss Nobody. Only this time, they had almost 60 years of technological advancements to aid their cause. Little Miss Nobody's remains were exhumed from what turned out to be their temporary resting place, then were sent for analysis at a state-of-the-art DNA testing facility. It was there that scientists determined that the previous estimate of the girl being seven years old was wildly inaccurate by modern standards, and that by their projections, the girl was no more than five years old, the exact age little Sharon was when she was abducted and presumably murdered. By January of 2022, DNA samples taken from Little Miss Nobody's corpse had been sent to a company known as Othram Inc., when the DNA results came back from the lab and the composite images of Little Miss Nobody were sent over from Texas, both were found to be a perfect match for the missing Sharon Gallegos. On March 15th of 2022, Arizona's Yavapai County Sheriff held a press conference where he announced that the mystery of Little Miss Nobody had finally been solved. One passage of his speech read, 
The unidentified little girl who won the hearts of Yavapai County in 1960 and who occupied the minds and time of our sheriff's office and partners for 62 years will now, rightfully, be given her name back. The sheriff remained hopeful that the perpetrators might still be found, but added that if they were still alive, they'd most likely be in their late 80s or early 90s. Prosecution might bring some small sense of justice, but the complications of bringing two senior citizens to trial would be far too numerous to expect a swift or satisfying conclusion. Those who sought to piece together the chain of events came up with various theories regarding the motive and identity of the abductors, but all agreed on one small mercy. Sharon's death had been relatively quick and relatively painless. There were no signs of torture or serious physical abuse, and seeing as she was wearing a new set of clothes and had her nails painted, it's reasonable to suspect that her abductors had at least tried to lessen her anguish during that brief period of capture. This isn't to excuse their actions in any shape or form, but rather a reminder that Sharon's fate could have been much, much worse given the circumstances. To this day, Sharon Diagos's killers remain unidentified. Her surviving relatives often hope for some kind of deathbed confession that the guilt of having taken such a young and innocent life would play on her killer's mind as the end of their life approached. Sadly, that doesn't seem to be the case, and in all likelihood, the truth of Sharon's final few moments on earth have been taken to the grave. Amber Hagerman's mother once described her as your typical all-American girl. She was a Girl Scout, she loved horses, and she dreamed of taking up cheerleading once she reached junior high. She also dearly loved her family and friends, but had a particular soft spot for her five-year-old brother, Ricky. The pair were inseparable, with Amber seeing herself as a kind of surrogate mother, but instead of using her role to boss her little brother around, she seemed much keener on guiding, protecting, and playing with him. On January 13th of 1996, nine-year-old Amber took Ricky out for a bike ride around the neighborhood. They took their usual route, stopped briefly at the parking lot of an abandoned grocery store where some of the neighborhood kids had set up a small ramp. Once their amateur aerobatics had concluded, Ricky told Amber that he wanted to go home, but was told to go on ahead. It's not clear why Amber chose to hang around an abandoned grocery store on her own, but the fact remains that it presented a very sinister opportunity to someone of unspeakable evil. A 78-year-old retiree named Jim Kevill later said that he witnessed a solitary Amber riding up and down the ramp when suddenly... A Caucasian male emerged from the derelict store to snatch the girl from her bicycle. Kevil then claimed the man dragged Amber to a black and dark blue pickup truck before speeding off down the street. She screamed when he grabbed her, Kevil added, so I figured the police ought to know about it. Uniformed officers arrived just minutes later, but it was too late. Little Amber Hagerman was gone. When five-year-old Ricky arrived home alone and informed his elders that Amber would be late, it slowed the process considerably. The cops knew they had a missing girl in their hands, but without knowing who she was or where she might be taken, there was very little to work with in terms of assuring her safe recovery. It was only when an increasingly concerned young Ricky rode all the way back to the parking lot that he realized something was wrong. Uniformed officers had taped off the parking lot with blue and white police tape, while the sight of his sister's bicycle, lying unridden on the pebble-strewn concrete, said more than words ever could. Local police quickly found themselves being offered the assistance of both the FBI and the Texas Rangers, while Amber's parents made several public appeals for their daughter's safe return. They believed their daughter was still alive and directly addressed her abductor, pleading with them to return her unharmed. Many others in Texas, as well as the wider U.S., held out hope that the whole thing was just some hideous misunderstanding and that Amber would soon be reunited with the parents. Tragically, however, this was not the case. Just four days after Amber was snatched from her bicycle, a man was walking his dog around five miles away from the abduction site. 
when the animal began to act in a very unusual manner. It began straining its leash and barking towards a local creek bed, and when its owner went to investigate, it discovered the nude corpse of a small child. Forensic examiners made their way to the scene, then transported the child's body to the county coroner's office for analysis. Amber's parents prayed that fingerprints and DNA would not be a match for their missing daughter, but once again, tragically, this was not the case. The thumbprint of the departed child was identical to the one printed on Amber's school safety card. They had found her, and she was gone. A subsequent autopsy revealed that Amber had been held captive for at least two days before she was murdered, and in that period, she had been frequently and brutally violated at the hands of her abductor. This period of horrifying torture only ended when Amber's abductor cut her throat, and in dumping her body in a shallow creek, her killer ensured that nearly all the forensic evidence connecting him to the murder would be entirely washed away. It was a move that ensured the continued frustration of investigating officers, who realized very quickly that they were dealing with a potential cold case. The investigation dragged on for months, before it was finally decided that the best course of action was to scale down the search and simply wait for developments to unfold naturally. It was tantamount to an admission that Amber's killer might never be found, but rather than wallow in grief and self-pity, Amber's parents decided on a different course of action. Donna Hagerman began pushing for stricter laws governing predators and offenders, and the sentiment was echoed by many outraged Texans. The righteous indignation culminated in a woman named Diane Simone calling into a Dallas radio station, and during that call, she presented what turned out to be a rather prophetic idea. If you can interrupt programming and alert us of severe weather at any given time, why can't you immediately report when a child has been abducted, Diane said. The idea was quickly picked up by state and federal authorities, who used it as the basis for a brand new system they christened Amber Alerts. The alerts work almost exactly as described and now come in the form of a text message which disseminates important information regarding a potential kidnapping. For example, the public are instructed to call 911 if they see a vehicle matching a certain description, meaning that within just a few hours of a child being abducted, the general public are armed with the knowledge to help find and rescue the child in question. In 2015, some estimated that the system had saved the lives of almost a thousand children nationwide, but for Donna Hagerman, the system's implementation had been bittersweet. In a 2016 interview, she openly wondered, if we would have had that alert when Amber went missing, could it have helped bring her back to me? Diane Simone, the woman who originally pitched the idea, was also interviewed around this time. Donna had her doubts, but Diane seemed quite sure that if such an alert system had existed at the time of Amber's abduction, she would have stood a much better chance of being returned alive. They were saying Amber was taken at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, thrown in the pickup truck, driven somewhere, and that nobody saw anything, Diane said. I'm sorry, but that's just not possible. The problem was not that people didn't see them, it's that they didn't know what they were seeing. In the years since Amber's abduction and murder, Texas law enforcement has investigated over 7,000 tips pertaining to the crime, but unfortunately, not a single one has proven fruitful. This has led many to believe that Amber's killer will never face justice, but lead detective Ben Lopez begs to differ. There's a possibility that someone knows something and just hasn't come forward for some reason, he said, and I certainly hope that's the case. It was also rumored that several potential witnesses, some of whom may have had game-changing information, refused to make themselves known to police on account of them being illegal immigrants. They had apparently been using a nearby laundromat on the day of the abduction, one with a clear view of the parking lot Amber was taken from. Lopez said that he understood why such people would be reluctant to talk to the police, but he urged them to come forward regardless. A person can give tips to law enforcement under complete and utter anonymity, he said. I don't care about a person's immigration status, that's not part of my job. What I care about is catching child killers. However, the illegal migrant theory was brought into question after a $75,000 reward was announced. 
Information was disseminated in both English and Spanish, with many broadcasts making it abundantly clear that police wished to talk to the customers of the laundromat, but not a single person even claiming to have been in the laundromat ever came forward. This has led some to suggest that the men in the laundromat weren't mere bystanders, but rather accomplices of the individual who snapped Amber. It's just as feasible that if the men were indeed undocumented migrants, that they returned to their countries of origin rather than face official deportation. What's clear is that no one in their right minds would turn their nose up to such a large amount of money, unless of course they had something to hide. As of 2023, Amber's case remains unsolved and the monster who abducted, violated, and murdered her might still be free to walk the streets. It makes us wonder if the monster who killed Amber Hegeman has since triggered any of the very same alerts his evil actions have helped create, and if in the future that same system might prove his final undoing. Born on September 23rd of 1916, in the small southeastern town of Maglier, Aldo Moreau grew up to be one of the most influential politicians of 20th century Italy. During the Second World War, Aldo was forcefully conscripted into the Italian armed forces and saw firsthand how extremist politics had set the European continent aflame. The experience inspired something of a political awakening in the once staunchly conservative Catholic, and he understood that for harmony to exist, there needed to be balance. He joined Italy's Christian Democracy Party, yet vehemently defended the rights and interests of the working poor. This combination of traditionalism and respect for the working classes proved extremely popular with the Italian people, and after serving as the party's Secretary General from 1959 to 1964, Aldo was elected to the position of Prime Minister. Politicians often make big promises during election campaigns, then fail to deliver once in office but not Aldo. He immediately instituted land reforms that made it much easier for poor farmers to own their own property, while making steps towards banning controversial farming practices such as sharecropping. Many of his fellow Christian Democrats considered Aldo's reforms too radical and accused him of selling out his voter base by flirting with socialism, but Aldo was above such petty labels. To him, there was nothing contradictory about respecting hard work, tradition, and the rights of the individual while ensuring the working classes didn't slide into poverty or exploitation. What's more, Aldo didn't consider politics a team sport. He's said to have once reminded a colleague that the word politics comes from the Greek word politica, meaning affairs of the cities. And what is a city if not a collection of different people with different cultures, customs, and ideas? If the once great city of Rome was to prosper again, there needed to be cooperation among political parties, not confrontation. Aldo was deposed as prime minister following the Italian general election of 1976, but just two years later, when a second general election was called, he announced that he'd run again. The announcement was soon followed by accusations of corruption, with critics alleging that Aldo had taken bribes during the so-called Lockheed scandal. Aldo was eventually cleared of all charges on March 3rd of 1978, and it seemed his vindication was the last hurdle to reinstatement as Prime Minister. Yet less than two weeks later, Aldo's life would be suddenly and permanently changed. On the morning of March 16th, 1978, Aldo was driving along Rome's Via Fani, a downward sloping street in the city's northern quarter. He and his five bodyguards drove in a convoy of four vehicles, but as they approached the bottom of the slope, two stolen vehicles suddenly appeared to block their advance. Sensing an ambush, the bodyguards attempted to reverse back up the slope, but another vehicle appeared at the top to block their retreat. Suddenly, a gang of men dressed in Air Italia uniforms emerged from some nearby undergrowth, each armed with a submachine gun and before Aldo's bodyguards could mount any kind of defense, they were slaughtered. The strike was chaotic, yet chillingly precise. Each of the four cars was riddled with bullet holes by the end of the attack, yet Aldo Moreau 
remained completely unharmed. He kept his trembling hands in the air as the armed men approached his vehicle, begging them for mercy as they dragged him from the back seat. Aldo was ordered to kneel and as he did so, he very likely expected to be executed on the spot. Yet instead of feeling a gun being pressed to his head, Aldo felt a hand jerking his hair back, forcing him to look up. That's him, he heard one of his attackers say. Now get him in the car. Less than an hour after the attack, a group calling themselves the Red Brigades claimed responsibility for the deaths of Aldo's bodyguards before announcing that the man himself was to be held hostage until their political demands were met in full. Established in the year 1970, the Red Brigades were a communist militant group who used industrial sabotage and high-profile kidnappings to draw attention to their cause. Their initial activities had been strictly non-violent and merely utilized the threat of such action to achieve their short-term goals. Yet it wasn't long before all such pledges were abandoned and the brigades began spilling blood to advance their so-called revolution. Following all those kidnapping, the brigades quickly announced their demands. If several of their comrades were released from prison, Aldo would be freed in turn. Italians quickly divided themselves into two camps, both in public and in the government. One camp was in favor of negotiating with the brigades, while the other refused any sort of compromise with those they quite rightfully referred to as terrorists. Fearing that negotiations would inspire further militant action, the Italian government announced its refusal to meet the Red Brigade's demands. Only a minority of parliamentarians disagreed with the stance, but the Italian public greeted the news with near-violent outrage. Given how popular his brand of politics was, Aldo Moreau was extremely popular among huge sections of Italian society. He's often been compared to Italy's JFK, and in many ways, that makes for a very accurate comparison. So when it was announced that the government would not attempt to negotiate his release and seemed more than happy to risk his execution, the public reaction bordered on hysterical. Trade unionists called for a general strike until Aldo's release was negotiated, while a variety of Italian law enforcement agencies scoured their respective jurisdictions. Approximately 13,000 officers conducted 40,000 raids while maintaining 72,000 roadblocks across the country. But sadly, no trace of the Red Brigades or Aldo Moreau could be found. During this period of the investigation, an estimated 16 million Italians took to the streets of Rome, Milan, and Turin, demanding that negotiations begin immediately. A handful of right-wing politicians called for Red Brigade prisoners to be tortured, and this sentiment was echoed by an alarmingly vast number of people. Thankfully, such a policy was never instituted, but it demonstrates the Italian public's sheer desperation to see their beloved Aldo released unharmed. The situation became so tense that the head of the Catholic Church, Pope Paul VI, released an open letter to the Red Brigades, pleading with them to release Aldo without condition. It's also rumored that the church attempted to reach out to the kidnappers around the same time the open letter was published in order to secretly negotiate a ransom payment. The Catholic Church has officially denied this being the case, and there's little reason to doubt them as either their attempts were half-hearted or the Red Brigades didn't take them seriously. Aldo Moreau was said to be a dear friend of Pope Paul VI, so it's doubtful the church would be anything less than zealous in the pursuit of his freedom. And from the perspective of the Red Brigades, it would be easy to mistake any genuine efforts to negotiate as some kind of ruse or trap. Seven weeks after Aldo Moreau was first kidnapped from the streets of the Italian capital, a secret meeting occurred in a small, dimly lit apartment in the city of Milan. The attendees constituted the Red Brigade's general committee, the main governing body which voted on the group's tactics and general strategy. That evening, there was only one solitary issue on the agenda, and after a long and difficult decision, the committee voted and came to a decision. It then ordered the release of what came to be known as Communication No. 9, which read as follows. For what concerns our proposal of an exchange of political prisoners in order to suspend the condemnation and to release Aldo Moreau, we can only record the clear refusal from the Christian Democrats. 
We thus conclude that the battle begun on 16 of March, executing the sentence to which the prisoner has been condemned. Aldo Moreau had been sentenced to death. On May 7th of 1978, a member of the Red Brigades visited Aldo in his secret holding cell somewhere in the Italian countryside and informed him of his fate. He was given the opportunity to write a goodbye letter to his family, in which he wrote, They have told me that they are going to kill me in a little while. I am kissing you for the last time. Two days later, on May 9th, Aldo's captors led him outside to a Red Reno 4, in the trunk was a large wicker basket. Aldo was told to climb in as he was being taken to a different top secret holding cell in a different part of the country. He did as he was told before a red blanket was placed over the basket in order to properly conceal it. In the final seconds of his life, it's possible that Aldo wondered why his captors walked away without closing the trunk. But as the first few bullets hit his body, the grim realization must have been beyond terrifying. A Red Brigade gunman named Mario Moretto opened fire on the basket from just a few feet away. Moments later, Aldo Moro was dead. The car containing Aldo's body was then driven to Via Michelangelo Caetani in the historic center of Rome, then parked in a location of great significance. The street was almost exactly halfway between the headquarters of the Christian Democrats and the Italian Communist Party, as if to say, here's meeting you halfway. Moro's funeral became a day of national mourning for Italians everywhere. Pope John IV personally officiated the proceedings, which were broadcast on almost every TV and radio station in the land. The Pope begged those in attendance to seek justice, not vengeance, but the public mood was difficult to temper. They demanded that those responsible be apprehended, dead or alive, and over the next 18 months, more than 12,000 people associated with the Red Brigades were detained and questioned. The group's entire leadership was tracked down and arrested, while anywhere between five and 600 of its members fled to Switzerland, France, and South America. Those who collaborated after their capture had family members executed by Red Brigade agents, including Patrizio Pecci, whose brother Roberto was shot dead in 1981. Finally, in January of 1983, a grand total of 32 members of the Red Brigades, along with a handful of affiliates, were sentenced to life imprisonment for their roles in Aldo's kidnap and murder. Just as the mysterious events surrounding the JFK assassination continue to capture the American imagination, the murder of Aldo Moreau continues to haunt Italy to this day. Rumor and intrigue led to a chilling rise in sinister conspiracy theories, many of which involved the CIA, the Israeli Mossad, and an ancient Masonic organization colloquially known as P2. Many claim that Moreau's willingness to work with socialists as well as his vocal support for Palestinian autonomy made him the enemy of the Western powers, who in turn orchestrated his kidnap and murder before blaming it on the Red Brigade. But the fact remains that the Red Brigade openly despised so-called moderates and would later assassinate a major figure in the trade union movement on the grounds that he was cooperating with state authorities to bring Moreau's killers to justice. The group had already committed itself to violent action in the years prior to Moreau's murder, and it had no problem continuing its campaign of terror in the years that followed. If Moreau's Christian Democrat colleagues did indeed want him dead for some inexplicable reason, as he was set to win them victory in the coming election, they certainly didn't need to conspire with violent communists to do it. They did it all on their own. Aldo Moreau continued to be revered and mourned by Italian politicians of all denominations, and his death is a depressing reminder that sometimes those who sue for peace make themselves the mortal enemies of those who long for war. In the early afternoon of July 13, 2012, 10-year-old Lyric Cook and her cousin, 8-year-old Elizabeth Collins, were riding their bikes through their small hometown of Evansdale, Iowa. The girl's grandmother, Wilma, had watched them depart at around 12.20pm, and it made them both promise to be home again by 2pm. 
But when the hour came and went and the two cousins were nowhere to be seen, their grandmother began to worry. Finally, at exactly 2.48 p.m., a terrified Wilma contacted the Evansdale Police Department to report her two granddaughters missing. Luckily, the area the girls went missing was only 15 miles away from an FBI field office, meaning the agency was able to lend its support within a matter of hours. Witnesses claim the girls were last seen riding down Evansdale's Gilbert Drive at around 1 p.m., which is just a stone's throw away from a place called Myers Lake. Myers Lake is a piece of state-owned parkland still popular with area fishermen, so it was feared the girls had drowned after stopping for an afternoon swim. The lake was a popular swimming spot in the summer months and, with it being mid-July, the girls had talked of visiting it with friends. Search and rescue teams made up of local law enforcement and civilian volunteers began to scour the area surrounding the lake for signs of the missing girls. Park staff then ordered the lake be partially drained in order to assist FBI divers, and when nothing was found, it raised the hopes of the girls' loved ones. If they hadn't drowned, they might still be alive, in which case they'd be somewhere in the surrounding area. Two days later, after Lyric and Lizzie disappeared, the FBI then orchestrated a far-reaching search-and-rescue operation to comb the surrounding countryside. The hundred-strong team included both tracker and cadaver dogs, along with airplanes equipped with heat-sensitive cameras. It seemed like nothing would be able to escape such a well-equipped search team, but to their utter confusion, barely a trace of the cousins could be found. Then finally, around 5 p.m. that evening, a volunteer search team consisting of Evansdale firefighters discovered two children's bicycles on the southeast corner of Myers Lake. The bicycles were photographed before the images were shown to the girls' parents. They were instantly recognized as having belonged to Lyric and Lizzie. As news spread of the sinister discovery, talk of an abduction began to spread. There was no way two little girls could cover the amount of ground needed to avoid the search team's dragnet, meaning they had to be taken from the area by a third party. What had started as a mild panic had taken a very grim turn, and although the girls' families did everything they could to raise awareness of their disappearance, it seemed only a matter of time before they received the darkest of news. Five months later, on December 5th of 2012, a group of hunters were stalking through the Seven Bridges Wildlife Park in Iowa's Bremer County. Seven Bridges is approximately 25 miles north of Myers Lake and is a popular spot for fishing, hiking, and hunting. It's billed as a great place for bird watching too, as its serene and isolated location fosters an optimum environment for avian breeding. Yet despite the wholesome veneer, the truth is that Seven Bridges is anything but tranquil. Records show that from 2010 to 2013, there were 28 different incidents of criminal activity in the park. One of these incidents included the discovery of a fully functioning meth lab, while another involved a report of knives being stuck into seemingly random trees. The hunters might have been well aware of the park's shady reputation, but seeing as the December snows had a habit of keeping miscreants indoors, they most likely expected a fairly uneventful hunting trip. But as they traipsed through the snow-blanketed forest, they came across something truly horrifying. Stacked under the boughs of a pine tree were the broken, frostbitten bodies of two young girls. Lyric and Lizzie had finally been found. In many cases, law enforcement ends up sharing a victim's cause of death with either journalists or the general public, but in the case of Lyric and Lizzie, officers kept this little detail a closely guarded secret. Some believe this was to protect the integrity of their investigation, yet a so-called inside informant purported that the reason the girl's cause of death was kept secret is that it was far too horrifying for the public to handle. Whoever killed Lyric Cook and Lizzie Collins had made a game of it, one that shook even the most veteran police officers to their core. After news of the body's discovery reached the town of Evansdale, a candlelit vigil was held at Myers Lake. Thousands of attendees listened as the town's mayor announced that Myers Park had been renamed Angels Park 
and that a monument would be erected to memorialize the departed cousins. The vigil helped Evansdale grieve, but those in attendance still grappled with the senselessness of the crime. Why would someone single out two innocent little girls for such a horrific act of violence, and why were the police so tight-lipped about the condition in which their bodies were found? Six months following the recovery of the girls' bodies, Evansdale Chief of Police announced that a number of reliable witnesses have come forward with pertinent information regarding the murder of Lyric and Lizzie. According to him, there was apparently a large white SUV similar to a Chevy Suburban or Ford Bronco parked near Myers Lake on the date of the girl's disappearance. The same SUV was then spotted by another member of the public, only this time it was just a hundred feet away from where Lyric and Lizzie's bikes were later discovered. This new information spurred a stalling investigation into overdrive and in the months that followed, FBI agents interviewed hundreds of registered child abusers in the hopes of generating a lead. When that avenue of investigation was proven to be a dead end, the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit authorized the release of the following offender profile. The idea was to generate tips from those who recognize certain activities or behaviors in their friends and loved ones. Anything from a 50 to 100% match could indicate that they had an intimate involvement in the murder of Lyric and Lizzie. The killer had to be familiar with both Myers Lake as well as the Seven Bridges Wildlife Area up in Bremer County. If any members of the public knew of anyone who frequented both areas for hunting or fishing, they were to contact the FBI's incident team immediately. The FBI believed the killer was most likely to be a resident of Evansdale, Bremer, or the communities that surrounded either. They suspected that a kind of social camouflage had been utilized, and that the killer's presence in certain areas didn't alarm suspicion because he was seen as a friendly face, so to speak. In order to trick the girls into leaving the park with him, the killer was most likely using some variety of quiet coercion. It's improbable that the girls would just walk off with a stranger of their own volition, so either they were intimidated into following their killer, or he was someone they were already familiar with. FBI analysts also stated that the killer has most likely experienced a bout of heavy stress about the time the murders occurred. They may have tried to offer an explanation for this stress, such as spousal problems, financial difficulties, mental health issues, or minor legal issues, but the FBI made clear that anyone whose reaction to such issues seemed uncharacteristic or disproportionate should be reported to federal authorities immediately. The FBI also asked the public to keep an eye out for anyone who showed an unusual or uncharacteristic interest in the media developments surrounding the case or for anyone who recently changed their appearance in a dramatic or unusual manner, such as shaving their head or facial hair or dyeing it a different color. Those who'd said to have recently sold or reupholstered their vehicles was also said to be considered suspects. Given the extensive list of indicators, a huge number of tips followed the release of the behavioral profile. Many of these tips seemed promising, but ultimately, none were of any substantial help to the investigation. It was around this time that many began to speculate that Lyric and Lizzie's murders were somehow connected to the local drug trade. The majority of Lyric Cook's family were addicted to methamphetamine, with her father, a man named Daniel Morrissey, having a history of manufacturing the drug inside their family home. He was even said to be cooking, as they call it, on the day police visited his home to inform him of his daughter's disappearance. Morrissey was believed to be involved in the sale of the drug, not just the manufacture, and rumor has it that he often oversold the quality of his meth, leading to many unhappy customers. Lizzie's parents had been very vocal in their belief that the cousin's disappearance was related to Morrissey's involvement in the methamphetamine trade, possibly as a way of punishing him for repeatedly ripping off clients or for stealing manufacturing equipment with which to continue his business. Lizzie's parents were so convinced of this that they refused to have any kind of joint memorial or funeral. While this may have been an ugly manifestation of their soul-destroying grief, it certainly makes for something to consider. Around 18 months after Lyric and Lizzie first went missing, Dan Morrissey received a sentence of 90 years after several severe narcotics convictions. Then four years into his sentence, 
He accepted the offer of a local media outlet to conduct an interview behind bars. Dan stated in all certainty that his criminal history had nothing to do with his daughter's murder. It doesn't even make sense if you think about it, he said. If I had any idea of somebody I owed money to or had threatened me or anything, you'd think I wouldn't know who that person was. They'd be the number one suspect on the case, and this would have been solved a long time ago. But there was absolutely nobody in my life that I owed money to or that I snitched on. And why would they abduct Elizabeth and my daughter at the same time in another town on a random bike ride that nobody knew they were going to take? It just doesn't make sense. In 2014, Lyric's mother, Misty Cook, was also sentenced to 10 years in prison for similar narcotics convictions. The circumstances aren't clear, but she ended up being released just a year later and has since claimed to have turned her life around. Misty claimed that the drug abuse which landed her in jail was a coping mechanism, one she developed in the wake of her daughter's death, and while she regretted falling into addiction, she refused to feel ashamed. Some have argued that whoever killed Lyric and Lizzie may have also been responsible for the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. In the early afternoon of February 13, 2017, Abby and Libby caught a ride to the Monon High Bridge in Delphi, Indiana. At exactly 2.07 p.m., Libby uploaded a photo to Snapchat depicting Abby standing alone on the bridge. The girl seemed fine and nothing seemed amiss, but just over an hour later, Libby's father couldn't get an answer to his calls, and when he arrived at the bridge to give them a ride home, they were nowhere to be seen. Derek German then contacted the local police, and by 5 p.m., the woods were alive with police and volunteers, all searching for the missing girls. It was hoped they'd simply wandered off before losing their way among the nearby woods, but sadly, their bodies were found the next morning lying in a creek bed near a roughly hewn trail. Some argue that there is an alarming number of similarities between the two crimes and that the perpetrators responsible for the Delphi murders is a serial killer who preys on young, vulnerable girls. Similarly to that of the Evansdale murders, no further information regarding the murder has been released by authorities, leading us to believe that the same level of sickening brutality was applied in the deaths of all four girls. Law enforcement has dismissed the idea that the two sets of slayings are linked, but if they're wrong, and the same man who took Lyric and Lizzie is responsible for the deaths of Abby and Libby, then it could only be a matter of time before they're once again stalking wooded areas, hunting for their next unsuspecting victims. On New Year's Eve of 2009, 10-year-old Masego Kugomo went on to play with her friends in the streets of a small South African township known as Soshangave. The name Shoshangave is an acronym actually consisting of the name of the four different tribes that live there, the Sotho, the Shangan, the Nungani, and Venda. Living quarters are divided purely on ethnic lines, a technique employed by the apartheid era government to sow distrust and conflict among the native population. Despite the minor ethnic tensions, Masego had a relatively peaceful and carefree upbringing with her parents Joseph and Kate doing all they could to support their young family. Masego usually abided by a strict curfew, but that evening, when she failed to return home at the agreed hour, her parents began to worry. After reporting their daughter's disappearance to the local police force, Kate and Joseph Kogomo enlisted the aid of friends, family members, and kind-hearted neighbors, then scoured the surrounding area in search of Masego. Over the next week, search and rescue parties, both amateur and professional, searched high and low for the missing girl. Frustratingly, no trace of her could be recovered, but Masego's parents never gave up hope of her safe return. Sadly, just eight days after her initial disappearance, a 38-year-old man named Brian Mangwale approached police officers with some solemn news. He then led them to a forested area, some distance away from the precinct, were lying half buried in a shallow grave were the remains of little Masego Kogomo. She had been tortured, mutilated, and dismembered. 
Suspecting that Brian Mangwale might himself be involved in the murder, local police placed him under arrest, then did the same with an acquaintance of his named Albert Mathebala. When questioned by police, Albert confessed to having witnessed Masego's murder. He claimed that on the night in question, he had been sitting in a parked car with a friend when suddenly none other than Brian Mangwale appeared from the shadows. In his company were a man, a woman, and a little girl, one that Albert seemed quite sure was Masego Kagomo. When confronted with Albert's revelation, Brian Mangwale began to panic. He had no alibi for that evening and couldn't refute the accusations put to him by the police. In the end, after severe beatings and threats of torture, he made a truly bone-chilling confession. Brian claimed that he, along with two other adults in his company, tricked little Masego into accompanying them to a derelict medical clinic. There, under the protection of several armed guards, Brian and his companions led Masego into an operating theater. Waiting for them were several older women, and one man all wearing the traditional Sangoma dress worn by southern African healers. When Masego entered the operating theater, she was frightened and confused, but when she saw the surgical instruments gleaming under the bright white lighting, she began to panic. Brian Mangwale then claimed that a woman approached Masego with a tissue and put it over her mouth. Then the child was not crying anymore. We made her eat and drink something. Then a woman named Jan cut her little girl's stomach open. She didn't scream, but I couldn't watch after that. They opened the girl up so they could see her organs and then they took them. Then I saw them on the operating table and I went outside and vomited. Brian later told police that he had been paid just less than $200 to bring a young girl to the derelict clinic after dark and had been hired by two people named Jan and Mabunda. Brian also admitted to having sold another girl to the organ traffickers just a few months before he abducted Masego. In that first instance, he was paid around $250 on account that his victim was younger and purer than the 10-year-old Masego. News of the murders horrified the South African public, who demanded that the organ trafficking ring be hunted down and eradicated. Brian Mangwale cooperated with the police, feeding them as much information as he could, yet despite having one of their names, none of the shadowy Sangoma were ever identified or arrested. Some speculated that the story was a pack of lies, a child killer's disposable attempt to divert blame from its rightful place. Yet in the days and weeks that followed his arrest, it slowly became evident that he'd been telling the truth. He had indeed sold a girl to organ traffickers, and by the looks of things, they were a very cunning and very dangerous group of people. They'd worked quickly, anonymously, and relatively cleanly. They used pseudonyms and preyed on the most vulnerable in society. Brian Mangwale confirmed that Masego Kogomo was not their first victim, and it seemed only a matter of time before they struck again. Despite his cooperation with law enforcement, Brian Mangwale was found guilty of both kidnapping and murder, and was subsequently sentenced to 60 years in prison. At his sentencing, the presiding judge told Brian, The crimes you have committed are serious in the extreme. You and your co-conspirators took away the life of an innocent girl to gain financially. What the court finds disturbing and gruesome is that it appears that she was mutilated while still alive. Mangwale's long sentence was welcomed by the South African Minister for Women, Lulu Zingwana, who said he deserved to rot in hell for his crimes. Yet Minister Zingwana was quick to remind people that the hunt for Masego's true killers was not over. What is worrying is that his accomplices are still out there, she said. We're going to work hand in hand with the community and the police to make sure that they are apprehended. The law will not rest until these people are brought to book. However, months after Brian Mangwala's trial concluded, a state prosecutor named MJ Makwatha dropped a legal bombshell on the South African media. He claimed that law enforcement had actually identified several of the organ traffickers, but were stuck in a rather precarious position. They didn't have enough physical, digital, or financial evidence to convict the traffickers of any crime, 
and in using them as a witness against Brian himself, they would need to be offered some kind of immunity. Therefore, the state neglected to approach, arrest, or even question the suspected organ traffickers on the grounds that it would spook them into shutting down their operation and possibly even fleeing the country. M.J. Magwatha claimed that he was assured that a case was being built against the organ trafficking ring, but to date, none of the suspects have been named or arrested. It makes us wonder just how many other trafficking rings exist in the world, and if some of them aren't a little closer to home, than we might expect. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, the 21st of September...